Welcome everyone. We've just started the recording for the webinar just to alert everyone that this webinar is is being recorded. We still have additional participants starting to join, but we will get started because we have a very packed agenda with great panelists and great content to share with you. This webinar has been organized by GADRES, which is the Global Alliance for Disaster Risk Reduction and Resilience in the Education Sector. This is a, a very wide partnership uh, with uh, many, many different agencies and NGOs and other partners as, as part of this partnership. You can see at the bottom the logos of all of the partners. And the webinar today is on engaging children and youth in disaster risk reduction and resilience building. And today it's really about solutions and really leveraging and engaging children and youth in those solutions. And so we'll go through this agenda, uh, you know, just to start a little bit of a general housekeeping, introduction to the webinar, a little bit about our speakers, the presentations that we will go through. And then if everyone can save their questions to the end, we will have an interactive panel discussion and, and then we will, we will close. So a little bit of housekeeping, as I mentioned before, this, this uh, webinar is being recorded. Please do keep your microphone on mute unless you're addressing the group if you if you raise your hand and you want to uh, make a statement or ask a question. And of course, please feel free to be very engaged and enter your, your questions in the in the Q and A uh, section of, of zoom. Um, for general questions or issues that you might have, you can add something to the chat and our, our colleagues uh, Tamara or Lucille could could help you. Great, so just an introduction to the webinar. So representing uh, more than half the world's population, children and youth under age 30 are among the most affected by disasters. However, they are absolutely part of the paradigm shift in solutions and are already making a difference. So more must be done to make sure that we can effectively support and engage children and youth worldwide in DRR and resilience building. The objectives of this webinar is to really introduce participants to key recent policy documents on the engagement of children and youth, provide examples of children and youth's engagement in DRR and resilience building, and then exchange lessons learned, evidence and opportunities, and really to identify the challenges and how to overcome those challenges. And I think we will be eager to hear from you as well as an audience to, to share your comments, your feedback, your questions as we, as we go on. So a little bit about our, our speakers. We have a, a great lineup here. Um, so we have our first speaker will be Audrey Oetli. She's the coordinator for child protection and emergencies at IFRC and global child protection area of, res of responsibility. We have Febrianti Shilia Apitule, education officer at UNICEF Indonesia country office. We have Mark Angelo Peñamora, youth facilitator and OIC president at Calisag. We have Maria Christine uh, Coronacion, Youth Facilitator, Radio Anchor Broadcaster at Spirit FM Radio Station and Vice President at Kalasa. Finally, we have Aline Overa. She's the Regional Focal Point in LAC with Child and Youth Consistency for Sustainable Communities. And I am going to moderate this uh, webinar. I'm Jen Stevens. I'm the Global Lead on DRR at UNICEF. Great, so over uh, to Audrey to kick us off. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to give you a teaser as an introduction about uh, the topic we have in front of you today. In particular, it will evolve around children and youth participation as a core uh, human right. Why is that? It's because we believe that climate change and related disasters are first and foremost a child rights crisis. And children do have a right to participate. In fact, it's one of their core human rights. Um, but yet we know that children and young people are too rarely consulted. So to give you a teaser, as I said, I just wanted to uh, give an example of uh, a recent youth survey that was carried out by the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent this year. Um, namely, we decided to consult children and young people directly 
because we wanted to hear from them about their perception, their understanding of climate change and climate related disasters, their, the worries they have, the actions they would like to take, and how much they are or not already involved in discussions and actions around climate related disasters and child protection. So we started looking uh, at Southeast Asia. We had the regional approach there because the region is highly vulnerable to climate change and climate related disasters. It also has a large population of children who are already at risk. Comprehensive laws are not in place to protect them from violence, abuse, neglect, and exploitation. So systems to protect them are under strain, especially in disasters. So we decided to consult the children. And for this, we developed an online survey, which enabled her to hear back from more than 30,000 youth. And what I would like to share with you today is some of the results of this consultation, because I believe it is uh, very informative and also will encourage us to address uh, the shared concerns. And it will also ensure we uh, practice meaningful child participation and engagement of youth throughout the DRM continuum. So what do children say? First of all, they state that they have a good understanding of climate change and climate related disasters. In fact, 90% indicated having those two issues in mind, with about a third of them thinking of those very often. 90% of the respondents also believed that the natural disasters that they had experienced in their community have been caused by climate change. Therefore, it's really not surprising that almost all of them, 93%, shared some level of concern ranging from little to extreme about climate change and disasters related to climate change. Commonly shared responses highlighted widespread climate anxiety, as well as fear of climate related disasters, leading to the extinctions of humans and the end of the world. A majority of the respondents also considered that disasters related to climate change either influenced or highly influenced the risk for them to be victim of physical or mental abuse. And um, as such, they consider that climate change, climate related disasters and child protection are and should be considered as integrated. So we also looked at the challenges they face to protect themselves in climate related disasters. And it's interesting because the most common barriers that were highlighted when attempting to act for better child protection or against climate change and related disasters was about not knowing where to start. This was uh, the response given by about 34% of the respondents. 90% of them, so almost all of them, would like to learn ways to have a plan to remain safe in case of disaster. And 63% of the respondents believe that someone their age can make a difference on climate change. So the majority um, already indicated having some opportunities to participate and share concerns and ideas. And in fact, many also indicated that they have already taken action in the last years, which is very encouraging. But children and young people also strongly felt the need to be better prepared. It's interesting because they wish that schools could be better equipped to raise their awareness and help them to act on climate change and related disasters but not just to evacuate. They also want to know how to protect themselves from violence and abuse arising with disasters. And in particular, if we, if we look deeper at the issues of what is it they want to learn more, uh, they indicated that they would like to be able to develop plans to remain safe. They would like to know where to get help and help others if needed. There was a really strong call that they wouldn't even know where to turn in case something happened to them or they wouldn't necessarily trust adults around them. And finally, um, the third most important call they had when it comes to learning was about participating in decision making that affect their physical and mental well-being. So I would therefore like to highlight that in all our programmings, we must involve children from the start. We must help them implement the solutions they identify and start or continue for those who are already doing it to integrate child protection considerations in everything we do. Um, so it is our collective responsibility to keep children safe. And uh, with this in mind, 
I would like to present some of the guidelines, interagency guidelines that have been adopted or launched uh, in the last few months and that aim at supporting the engagement of children and youth in DRR and resilience building. So in particular, today we will focus on two of those guidelines. The first one is the Interagency Standing Committee guidelines on working for, with, sorry, working with and for young people in humanitarian and protected crisis. And the other one is a words into action guidelines, engaging children and youth in DRR and resilience building. So let me start with the ISC guidelines. Um, why, why was this developed? So the ISC youth guidelines provide a framework for working with and for young people throughout the humanitarian program cycle. It provides us with tips, examples, and case studies. And it can be used to, as a reference if you want to design programs that respond to the context. It's meant for all the phases of humanitarian action, for both rapid onset, slow onset emergencies. It concerns um, natural hazards, conflict, protracted crisis, as well as refugee and internal displacement situations and peace building context. So you can really see that the guidelines cover all of the context possible. And um, it aims to assist you, everyone actually, in delivering, in, per, um, in, in delivering those programmings for the young people, because we believe that adolescents and youth are a positive force in emergency preparedness and response, that they have a wide range of um, capacities as well as unique needs, but they often get lost between programming for children and programming for adults. We don't take them seriously enough. We don't involve them sufficiently. So the guidelines are not about just mainstreaming their needs. It's about recognizing the contributions that they can make uh, towards improving humanitarian response and programming. And so the guidelines are for all of us, I think all humanitarian aid staff at country level, um, and they really help us uh, by providing a framework for working with and for the young people uh, with concrete example and case studies. And as you can see, they are also accompanied by uh, a facilitator's guide uh, that is basically a, a second resource to help you uh, develop similar um, actions and um, help you adapt to the local context to, uh, to ensure practical and cultural appropriateness. So in the next slide, you will see um, a snapshot of um, the guidelines. So with many examples and case studies. So you see there are five sections. The first one is about uh, principles. Then you have something around meaningful participation, um, children and young people uh, in throughout the program cycle. Um, section uh, D is about how young people can be involved and engaged in, in every phase of the humanitarian response. And in section E, which is probably the bulk of the guidelines, it's really about implementing adolescent and youth uh, responsive programming across sectors. So this gives you uh, an overview. I think the link will be shared in, in the chat. And of course, it's really worth reading those guidelines to, to help you with any, any form of programming you may have on this. Then on the, on the next slide, um, I would like to present briefly the words into action guidelines uh, that also aim at ensuring worldwide access to expertise, communities of practices and networks uh, for DRR practitioners. Again, you will find there uh, a lot of specific advice on implementing people-centered approach to supporting and engaging children in disaster risk reduction and resilience building. And you will also have links to multiple resources that will help you with more in-depth information and uh, make the connections with different interrelated areas. So I welcome you to, to consult those and reach out if you have questions on, on those um, important interagency guidelines that were developed to show us the way and uh, give us some strong models on how, how to do it in an easy manner. Then um, maybe a few last words uh, about planning education with and for youth. Uh, here again, you will see that it's very important to engage children and youth at every single stage uh, 
of the process. It can be in the analysis, for instance, by involving them in uh, doing multi-hazard mappings in their community. It can be about um, involving children in, in policy, for instance, um, initiating some peer-to-peer -peer dialogues or use to adults dialogue. As we heard in the survey, it's sometimes not easy for them to have their voices heard. And um, the survey is another exam example of how to, to have children and youth opinions and the, uh, how to, to make the most of it to, in, to improve our programming. Then, of course, they have their place in programming uh, where we absolutely want to recognize their own priorities uh, concerning the education that they need. Um, we need uh, to consider them in the cost and financing and, of course, in monitoring and evaluation where uh, including, for instance, child and youth sensitive indicators would be most welcome. So uh, I think now we have a, a very short but comprehensive overview of the tools that are already in our hands. And before turning to, to concrete case studies, I just wanted to summarize three key points from this introduction. The first one is really that more work must be done to support and engage children and youth in disaster risk reduction and resilience building. Uh, we've started, we have examples, but the bulk of the work is ahead. Um, then we have also those two amazing guidelines uh, to help us frame children and youth engagement. Uh, they're rich with examples. We, we will see and, and hear later from our other colleagues how other examples are coming up and can inspire us. And uh, finally, we also have some concrete case studies um, that will demonstrate how this can be operationalized in the different settings. So thank you very much. I will hand over back to, to you and if, if remain available if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Audrey. That is, that is a great uh, foundation for this webinar to see how much has already been done and what we can build on. Um, moving forward and to always improve upon what what already exists and, and that's great, thank you so much for sharing all of this information I know we're short on on time. Um, but we do have a poll now um, that will be coming up and I think it'll pop up on your screen and if you could just answer the, the survey uh, quickly. Um, that would be great. Um, let us know if it's not coming up for you in the chat. And so these questions are essentially about gauging whether or not you were already familiar or engaging in some of these guidelines um, that Audrey presented um, and whether you were familiar or working on, on these issues previously. Okay, we're getting some more responses. So many, many of us were not familiar with the IASC guidelines uh, so far. Several, several were, only one or or both. Um, whether or not we've used these these guidelines to support our work directly. A lot, most of us, 68% so far, have never used any. So this is great. This is going to have impact to start using these gui in guidelines. <laughs> um, great. So I think this is a good baseline to, to go with. And I think we have a lot of room for, for growth here. Thanks, everyone, for participating in the poll. Yeah, it's very interesting. So, so thanks everyone, and we will share the the final results with everyone after after this webinar as well, and, and the report of the webinar. So, thank you for sharing your your perspective and your experience. I think we we will move on now to the the first case study. So, I I will invite um, 
Febrianti from UNICEF country office in Indonesia to join us and to make her presentation. Thank you so much, Jen, for the opportunity. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, colleagues. Uh, my name is Febi. I'm the Education Officer from Indo UNICEF Indonesia Country Office. And for this opportunity, I would like to share some of the case study, uh, our experiences um, on the mainstreaming adolescent participation in Indonesia, in particular for disaster preparedness. Uh, response and recovery. But before I go uh, into the details about how we're going to do that, um, basically from our experiences, uh, we can go to the next slide uh, where I will share with you the context of, you know, being an adolescent and also the context of being in Indonesia. So as you're probably aware and familiar, um, Indonesia is basically a very large country. We have three different time zone, consists of 17, more than 17,000 um, island, and we have 46 strong, uh, 46 million strong adolescents in Indonesia. Um, but with that, uh, there's a consequences of living in Indonesia since we are also located in the ring of fire. So there's a lot of like um, hazard and uh, disaster prone areas and risk that we have to basically endure on, you know, every single, um, every single day. Um, and basically, um, what our main objective when we're working with adolescents, we're working uh, with and for adolescents, basically, we're trying to strengthen the participations and the rights of the adolescent, including the most uh, vulnerable. So in there, in basically our implementations, uh, they can be empowered and can generate solutions and influence uh, decisions and the impact regarding their health, uh, their safety, their educations and well-being during and uh, after the emergency, because I think this is the reality that we in Indonesia uh, live in on a daily basis. So that's a very important thing, and that's something that we would like to empower. So um, as you probably see on the screen, um, if you can see, um, basically there are several, with, with, with these conditions, um, there are several polls that we, we basically launch for young people in the past couple of years to basically see how we can empower them, what kind of issues that basically um, become their interests. And one of the polls that we did on our EU report uh, polls stated that um, basically climate change and disasters becomes one of the most prominent issues that adolescents in Indonesia care about. Um, and basically, when we ask about how they usually engage or have the conversations where, you know, when they participate, they feel that they can bring up the issues about the climate change and also uh, disasters. Um, they found that um, this is, even if it's a concern, um, some of the people um, on, uh, or the adolescents think that they need more room to basically participate and creating a solution regarding the issue concerning them, uh, concerning them. And one of this, uh, which is the disasters and also the emergency. So from that uh, factual and basically the facts that we um, gathered, based on our polls with young people. Um, we are committed to ensuring that adolescent Indonesia um, are safe, protected, and prepared before, during, and after the hazardous event. Um, and that's basically become our main commitment with our development partners as well as our government partners. So before, uh, during the implementation, uh, such initiatives that we have with adolescents and for adolescents is basically led and developed by adults for adolescents. But it's still very limited to involve them actively. And even though young people needs a diver, um, you know, solution and a way to participate, uh, participate. Um, basically, it's still mainly led by adult uh, in making decision for the adolescents and our commitment now um we would like to doing things differently in, in Indonesia by listening to and basically partnering with adolescents, including girls, boys, and the most marginalized to basically inform our programs, what can we do for them and ensure that basically during this situation, an emergency and disaster situation, we are truly responsive to the needs. Um, we are basically accelerating this effort uh, for early citizenship engagement and recognizing that the investment for young people, including adolescent will have significance and long-term uh, benefit. So why the, uh, the, the, uh, the investment 
um, and engagement with and for adolescents is very important. I think the Article 12 or of Convention of the Rights of the Child, uh, which has been ratified by the government of Indonesia, is basically become our um, um, umbrella uh, for in intervention. And even if sometimes uh, the participation is basically articulated in national policy, um, but we still found the challenge in mainstreaming adolescent viewpoints and solution um, to basically create the space which are safe for adolescents to basically participate during this emergency and to create the solutions uh, with the issues affecting them. So that's basically become our approach and what we try to do with adolescents in Indonesia. So the next questions would be how then we can basically do that, how we can support and strengthen and empower adolescents, especially during this disaster um, area or the emergency situation. So we can go to the next slide where um, there's a methodology that basically UNICEF in Indonesia use and utilize to basically work with and for adolescents. So beside, if you hear from Audrey previously, there's an interagency standing committee guidelines on how we can work with and for young people during the humanitarian and proactive crisis. Um, so this basically influence also the way we work with adolescents in Indonesia. So one of the methodology that we use is basically called Adolescent Kit. Um, so in 2021, UNICEF Indonesia embedded adolescent participation into it our five-year programming strategy as a cross-sectoral approach which accelerated the result for adolescent-centered program. And one of the examples that we use is basically how we implement adolescent kit for expression and innovation, which basically serve as a catalyst for a wider focus on adolescent engagement in DRR response and also beyond. So it's not, also, it's not only limited in emergency situation. So if you're not familiar, uh, the question is basically, what is adolescent kit for um, and expressions? Um, so UNICEF adolescent kit is basically an adaptable package of guidance, um, tools, activities, and supplies to basically support adolescent age 10 to 19 years old, especially those affected by humanitarian and proactive crisis. So this adolescent kit developed through a human-centered design process with adolescents and focus on how we can develop their skills and competencies to basically help them express themselves, participate in decision making, uh, which affect their lives, and basically contribute uh, to the positive change that they have in their community. So this kit um, and activity center around what we call adolescent circles. So there's a group of adolescents um, who gather to learn, uh, practice the skills, build their competency, um, socialize, express themselves. Um, and also lastly, what we would like to support them is basically for them to take action in their community. So if you can see in the screen, there's some um, activities uh, take um, shape into four phase approach and using an iterative process to basically how they can identify the problems in their communities, how they can basically support them and find a solution for the issue concerning them. Um, in Indonesia, basically what we have done with this kit is basically uh, we, uh, translate and contextualize the entire package of the adolescent kit, make it available in Bahasa Indonesia because we would like this activity to be familiar with adolescents and Bahasa Indonesia is basically one way that we can communicate comfortably with adolescents, so it's translated in Bahasa. Uh, we also adding some of the component with the relevant issues regarding to the um, relevant challenges that adolescents face in Indonesia. Uh, we manage a local procurement of supply uh, kits. Um, activities are also updated. Uh, we strengthen the DRR components on the kit and we develop um, easy quick guide. So when we distribute it, it can basically help the local community, the youth facilitator, adult facilitator, and also adolescents themselves, how they can run this activity. So how does this um, methodolo uh, methodology and supply kit and the component works? So the first one is basically when we do the intervention during the emergency situation, um, we can go to the previous uh, slide. Um, yes, thank you so much. So 
our the, the way we work with the skit and methodology is basically we're trying to address the meaningful participation component for adolescents so how we can work with and for adolescents to first uh, provide the space the safe space for adolescents to participate including during the emergency situation the second is basically provide and strengthen their voice where they can basically express themselves they can basically see what kind of challenges and problems that they face during the emergency situation and beyond um, and there's an audience when they're basically expressing what they feel um, what kind of support do they need what kind of changes do they need um, and then how we can support them and um, basically address these issues and address the voice uh, that they have expressed us in and basically influence them into a local community or strengthen that into the subnational uh, plan. So um, with this mode of participation, we first um, strengthen the capacity and skills of facilitators who work and support the adolescents. So the first one, what we did is basically youth facilitators that engage with adolescents receive training to strengthen their capacity and their skills to best accommodate um, the activities with the adolescents. Um, and the second one is basically the, the facilitators and adolescents who has been trained with this methodology, with these resources, can as establish these small groups we call adolescent circles. So the groups consist of like 10 to 20 adolescents. They can basically run through all the activities inside the adolescent kid methodology um, from the start to finish, how they form the group, how basically they can see the community, what kind of challenges and problems that they face in their community and how basically they can create a solution while also empowering or developing the skills and competency they need. And after that, uh, the girls and the boys will build the skills through adolescent kids session. They identify the issues in their community, working together as a team and in the group to basically create a solution and develop the prototype um, in addressing the problems that they have identified uh, previously and they present their solution to the community. So there's a safe space for them to do the activity. There's a safe space for them to also present what they found, what the solution that they propose to all the stakeholders and um, local decision makers and the community and basically how we can help them address these issues, uh, deliver the message um, and hopefully creating the changes that they would like to see in their community. So that's basically uh, the step by step process, how we engage the adolescents during the emergency with the methodology that we call them as adolescent kid. So uh, we are not only focusing on strengthening adolescent, that's the core or how we can support them, but also creating this enabling environment where adult youth facilitator, uh, the local stakeholders or local decision makers are also present to build this safe space and support the participation of adolescents during the emergency. We can go to the next slide. Yeah, so uh, with our key programs implementations during the emergency and beyond with and for adolescents, um, one of the way that we do it is basically through the implementation of this adolescent kid methodology. But this methodology itself is not a rigid one. We can basically contextualize, adapt it, embed it, upstreaming it, and that's basically become a lessons learned of Indonesia country office on how we have been working uh, with adolescents to support this meaningful participation. So they're not only become a beneficiary, but they can actively inform our programming during the emergency, the situation in their community, and also create the solutions from uh, the issues that concerning them. So there are some things how we contextualize or how we basically implement this um, methodology in Indonesia to support adolescent participation. So the first one is basically, even if the adolescent kit initially designed as a methodology to target emergency response, but this activity actually could be used um, after a disaster to ensure that the voice of young people are included in the response and recovery. So this is not only, you know, a methodology that only fit for emergency context. In the emergency context, uh, from our experience, we see there's a lot of challenges um, and also, you know, 
ongoing issues um, inside the emergency situation itself. So we dealt with mental health issues for adolescents. We've dealt also with a child marriage issues as, as an aftermath of the emergency. We talk about how they didn't have access to a proper learning opportunities during the emergency. And basically, this uh, methodology can be utilized and contextualized to suit their need, uh, that, that specific needs um, and issues. So we recognize its wider potential and a need for longer term adolescent engagement. So it's, it doesn't stop only in emergency situation, but how this circles, this methodology, these activities can be utilized and integrated across all sectors and our focus areas with adolescents, including education, including child protection, including child safeguarding, mental health, and also social policy. So that's basically uh, what we experience. Um, and we basically engage adolescents not only in, 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 in the subnational level or the specific location where emergency occur, occur, but I will explain a little bit further how then this methodology you know, embedded into the national level and how we work with the national government, and our development partners to strengthen their intervention and adolescent participation as well. Uh, from our experiences uh, during COVID-19, uh, we use this kit uh, to provide the psychosocial support and intervention for adolescents during the COVID-19 pandemic back in 2020. Um, we use it also um, with civil societies and government partners to address harmful gender and social norms that uphold uh, child marriage issues and also address the social norms and beliefs around adolescent participation um, so that young people voice can be amplified and for their roles in the community to be strengthened and recognized. So that's how we basically embed this methodology into different streams of our work with adolescent in Indonesia. We can go to the next level. Uh, next slide, please. Riani, sorry, one, one or two minutes to wrap up on this one. Sorry. Yes. So the some of the key findings in units of Indonesia comes finding is basically this is the most tangible actions that we have. So we in, in uh, we work with government in national and national level where we train the youth facilitators, we train the uh, government partners to basically equip this with the methodology where they can be ready when the emergency situation arise. They have resources, skills, and competency to also help adolescents build their competency during the emergency. So if you can see in the slide, there's some government and NGO partner partners that have been trained. We basically use this methodology and embed it into certain uh, curriculums, such as comprehensive school safety curriculums, adapt into extracurricular uh, curriculum, and also life skills education curriculum, where we, inter uh, we basically do the piloting in several areas areas with disaster prone um, potential. We use it also for child marriage in several areas in Indonesia and COVID-19. And some of the findings that we have that this methodology is basically help build adolescent girls and boys skills and capacity to identify challenge and solution. Participation needs to be supported with relevant, you know, adult skills and enabling um, environment to support uh, adolescent participation and how this can be utilized for a large intervention. Uh, next slide, please, and I can wrap up. Yes, so the key lessons learned for our intervention strengthen um, adolescent participation during emergency is to create an enabling environment for adolescent participation where skills building for both adult and uh, adolescents is important. Link this adolescent participation to civic and community engagement so it can be sustainable beyond the emergency intervention. Include systematic monitoring and evaluation of adolescent participation where we use different uh, international guidelines like um, interagency standing committees guidelines that previously mentioned and to see how we can support the adolescents utilizing digital space and recognize it, and even if recognizing the digital divide that happened within one context of the country. So that's basically the presentations and case study that we in Indonesia country offices learn. I hope it can be benefit uh, for everyone in the audience. And please, if you have any questions and um, comments, I can help is I can help to address this later. Thank you so much and back to you, Jen. 
Thank you so much, Fabrianti. I, sorry to cut you short. I, I know every, you have so much content to share and it's great that you put it together with the big picture with concrete um, tactics to make sure that it, it, it moves forward effectively in Indonesia. And that's, that's been really helpful. And if anyone has questions, please do put them in the Q&A and, and save them for the discussion. Uh, we'll, we'll move on now to the next presentation where I'll invite Mark and Maria to present on Youth Organizations United Towards Harmonizing Leadership, Empowerment, and Development. Over to you. Good day, everyone. It is a privilege to be with you on this meaningful event as we gather for the Global Alliance for Disaster Risk Reduction and Resilience Building in the Education Sector or CADRES. What we brought for you today are stories of involvement and experiences of youth organization from the Philippines, specifically in the areas of Real, Infanta, and General Nakar Arena communities. We hope to gain your interest as we are excited to share with the world our cons consistent efforts to help our communities become prepared of any disaster, may it be natural or man-made. Again, greetings from the Philippines. I am Mark Angel of Rubio Peñamora, 21 years old. I started to be involved in community activities when I was in third grade. Now, I am a college student taking up Bachelor of Science in Secondary Education. I am one of many youths trained by Reina Federation together with Child Fund to become a youth leader and facilitator. Hello again, everyone. I am Maria Christine Coronacion, 18 years old. Just like Mark, I was also in grade three when I became active in community development activities in our area. Now, I am a grade 12 senior high student. I am grateful that organizations like Reina Federation and Child Fund for giving us youth the opportunity to voice our concerns in different platforms like here in Gadres. Our presentation is entitled Youth-Led. It stands for Youth Organizations United Towards Harmonizing Leadership, Empowerment, and Development. As a short background, we are composed of several youth organizations from 26 villages, and we aim to have our voices be heard, unite our efforts, and collectively take actions based on our evolving capacities. We started from being members of children associations where we first learned our rights and responsibilities until we become familiar with the deprived, excluded, vulnerable situation of many children in our communities. Our youth associations have been supported by Rena Federation, a parent association formed after a tragic flash flood in November of 2004, Child Fund and its sponsorship program opened a lot of doors for us too so we can hone our talents and skills and become valuable members of our community. Our province is situated in the biggest island of our country that we call on. Specifically, Reina or Real Infanta and General Nakar is located between the Pacific Ocean and Sierra Madre mountain ranges. Facing the Pacific Ocean, we are very prone to typhoons, tides, earthquakes, and tsunamis. On the other hand, while the Sierra Madre Mountains protect us from strong winds, illegal activities made us vulnerable from flash floods and mudslides. The illegal livelihoods in our mountains also pose threats not only to human lives, but to thousands of endemic species, as well as supply of food and water. But as active and involved youths of our communities, we know we cannot just wait for adults to solve these problems alone. We know we can do something. We can contrib contribute our time, our energy, our creativity and talents to make every child, every youth, every family, and our village prepared for and resilient of these disasters. The big ideas that we want to share with you are grouped into three such as legal basis of our advocacy, our link to the RRM framework, and most especially, our experiences and participation in youth-led DRR program. Let me show you how we begin by looking back, back at our worthwhile journey. 
the first year of Reina Pe Federation, they organized children and youth associations. One year later, a grant project from Child Fund Australia gave the opportunity to consolidate the different children and, and youth groups to become eco scouts or should I say ecological scouts, an advocacy arm of the federation that is composed of different interest groups to support their environmental protection and conservation advocacy, including DRR topics. One year after the formation of Eco Scout, the Youth Led Disaster Risk Reduction became the flagship program of our youth associations. This back up by the Public Act 10121 or the DRRM Act. Through the years, we did several advocacies at different levels from schools to families and communities. Moving on, we also networked to and invited by many pro environment organizations in the country gaining the trust of and partnership with the local and national government agencies like the Department of Social Welfare and Development is another huge achievement for our association. At the onset of our organizing activities, we are aware of the need to be relevant to local and national DRR-related laws. Such way, our efforts is always grounded on the basis of existing policies. Thus, our fund support and sustainability can be assured. The DRR, DRRM Act of 2010, which aims to encourage community, especially the youth, to participate in disaster risk reduction and management activity. It was a perfect timing for our group and our advocacy that the Philippines DRRM Act is further enhanced, creating another Republic Act called TERPA, or Children's Emergency Relief and Protection Act. This gives premium to children and youth protection during emergency. This law ensures that all children are safe before, during, after the calamity or other types of emergency. Meantime, the DRR framework is the backbone of our advocacy activities. Following the four DRR phases, including prevention and mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery. We also make it a point that our members are well-versed of these phases of DRRM as we became important contributors to our village disaster preparedness and plans. For the first phase of DRRM, which is prevention and mitigation, the aim is to avoid hazards and lessen its impacts. That is why we did three major continuing activities such as tree planting and nurturing, clean up tribes, and IECs or information drive, education, and campaign activities. For these activities, our overall role involved mobilization, facilitation, preparation of IEC materials, lead in advocacy activities, and of course, as direct participants like in tree planting. The table here shows the major contributions of children and youth under the prevention and mitigation. It also shows the numbers of beneficiaries reached for every intervention. Our efforts on the RRM framework prevention and mitigation resulted in 10,000 native trees planted, maintained five kilometers of coastal areas cleaned each year, and several villages, schools, and IT communities visited and oriented on the RRM. In these activities, we take roles as the lead facilitator or direct participant. We also help in the identification and mobilization of participants and prepare our own advocacy materials. For the preparedness phase, our activities can be grouped into three. And this includes community and school activities. Due to the pandemic restriction, we now have home-based activities. We just maximize the available communication apps. And the average of regular advocacy before the pandemic have reached 3,000 children and youth per year through our three, 130 youth facilitators. Additionally, our home-based activities were able to help 1,370 families raise their awareness on the RRM. Emergency plan and evacuation maps were our major topics shared to them. To make it more relevant, 
We also discussed facts about COVID-19 and had sharing on quarantine experiences that might be affected the youth, the youth's mental health. I would also like to highlight a little bit more how youth like us become instrumental to the disaster risk reduction management plan in our village. Recognizing our acquired knowledge, skills, and attitudes concerning DRRM, we were regularly invited as part of the planning with multi-sectoral groups. Moving forward, the response phase of our advocacy, the aim is to educate children and youth, families and communities on life preservation and basic substance needs. On our little but evolving capacities, we were still able to contribute on this through our youth development sessions, where we do not only raise their awareness on this specific DRM concern, but also encourage them to be like us, offering voluntary our time and effort for the mission of our, of our youth associations. On the first quarter of 2020, our association had its first hand experience in disaster response during the eruption of a volcano in, in a nearby process, province. After thorough preparations, a group of facilitators, including us, went to five evacuation areas for the Taal volcano victims. We stayed there for one week with the task of facilitating the children and youth developmental activities through our child-centered spaces. Another quarter passed and the COVID-19 outbreak happened in our country. Aside from the threat of the virus, our mental health was also affected by strict quarantine rules, preventing children and youth to go to school and stay at home every day. We did me mental health and psychosocial support system or our MHPSS and psychological first aid or PFA. Doing such, we were able to practice everything that we've, we've been trained for and everything that we've learned with the past years. We specifically did Kamustahan, which means, how are you in English? This activity allows children and youth to express their hidden emotions after being stricken by COVID-19 and typhoon. For the last phase of DRR, rehabilitation and recovery, the aim is to restore and improve facilities, living condition, and capacities. We expand here the MHPSS and PFA activities to continuously support the mental health of children and youth in our little ways. But this time, we gave emphasis on the need to become proactive by acquiring the right knowledge, skills, and attitude towards PRR resilience building. In addition, we highlighted the importance of creating their own family DRR plan and family evacuation map, anticipating these things in advance, have somewhat eased the worries of our participants because we now know what to do, what to prepare, where to go in times of disasters. They also made the in total, there were 828 children and youth reached and 569 parents oriented on the DRRM. To summarize all our journey in experiences and involvement, we underwent trainings and conducted activities that enhances our skills on leadership, public speaking, facilitation, and formation of children and youth groups. We also learned documentation, partnership building, lobbying, and networking at the level of our current capacities. More so, we are grateful for the DRR-related life skills that we acquire, as well as for the chance to showcase our talents through interest groups. Shown in the, shown in the slide are the list of experiences and accomplishments covering our involvement in the whole DRRM process. What is left to do for our youth association concerns a sustainability plan. To ensure our advocacies will continue, we have ongoing recruitment and trainings for second line of children and youth leaders. We also tied up with the Department of Social Welfare and Development, both at the national and local levels. We will also include tapping academics in our areas to help us conduct our in-school activities. 
either through online or when face-to-face -face learning becomes accessible again. Challenges. We all know that the world is still batting COVID-19 and its evolving strains. In our area, we just recovered from a three-month period. Can you believe it? Three-month period of high COVID cases that paralyzed the operations of our only hospital. So we need to con continue our mental health and psychosocial support. But this time, we need to review our topics and process, as well as our limitations, to make our activity design still relevant and inclusive to both children and youth. That another challenge that we face is the conflicting schedule of schooling or working youth. But all this concern will be, of course, discussed by our association with the guidance of Reina Federation and Child Fund so we can create a doable and realistic plan of action. That would be all for the youth led DRR experience and the accomplishment of the Philippines, specifically in the Reina area. We hope that we are able to contribute meaningfully and you learn things about the potential of children and youth to become instrumental in DRR advocacy. We also wish for continuous support from other sectors, may it be local or international, so that we can continue what we have started, magnify our voices, reach more people, and confidently communicate our advocacies. Thank you. Or in Filipino, we say, Salamat, Salamat po! po. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that excellent presentation uh, that was very concrete and it, it paves the path forward and it, it already starts to address some of the questions we saw in the, in the chat around, you know, turning aspirations and, and policy into action. And I liked also the common thread also building on what Febrianti had said earlier about how when you're working with, with children and youth, you, you don't only focus on children and youth, you have to focus on how they connect to their families, to their networks, to really empower them to engage with decision makers. And I, I think that was a great, a great point uh, that, that's coming out strongly. So thank you so much again. And, and moving on now to, to the next presentation, I'll, I'll hand it over to Alina who will talk about engagement of Mexican elementary school students in DRR. Over to you, Alina. Hello, and thank you, Gadres, for the opportunity of sharing the collective efforts done in Mexico City to raise awareness in disaster risk management and disaster risk reduction in children and youth vulnerable groups. First of all, and to give a geological context, Mexico is an earthquake prone country located in the Pacific Ocean Ring of Fire. Earthquakes in Mexico happen due to the subduction of the Pacific uh, Plate under the North American Plate. While most of the seismic activity concentrates on the Pacific coast in states like Guerrero, this is Guerrero, Chiapas, and Oaxaca, Mexico City has a particular set of geological and social traits that make the zone extremely vulnerable to geological hazards. In order to assess and manage risk, three different zones have been established in Mexico City in terms of vulnerability caused by soils, by soils behavior during the stress given the effects of earthquake waves. Since Mexico City is located in the remains of a lake, soil has a higher than average water content compared to nearby regions, and sediment particles are on this smaller side, thus creating an effect of instability during movement and therefore a substantially weaker base for buildings. This translates to the characterization of a zone where the soil is humid and unstable, a transition zone that behaves in a more stable way and a rocky solid zone comprised by volcanic deposits. Also, Mexico City is located in the middle of Valley of Mexico, meaning that it is surrounded by low height mountains. This specific condition results in earthquake waves bouncing throughout the valley and creating amplification of waves. This implies a higher level of damage and intensity reflected in the initially large scale damages in the city during an earthquake. Centralization of economic activities in a single location leads to the deficient territorial planning and forces people to settle in vulnerable zones. This is the case of Mexico City's center and its surroundings. 
being the most populous city in North America with more than 9 million habitants, from those 2 million are children and youth, this can only mean overcrowded area near the zones with the most economic activities. As this is the case, housing prices have been become unpayable to the vast majority of people that, looking for unemployment, usually opt to live in the very developed outside of, Mexi of the Mexican capital city. This creates two major scenarios of vulnerability that keep repeating over the years. The first one occurs with the materialization of risk, hits densely concentration job corridors, and a large quantity of people are affected through direct impact, as in injuries or death, and through indirect impact, as buildings, factories, or general business centers may not resist the amplified effects of earthquakes. Therefore, people lose their jobs and are forced to drastically change their lifestyles. The second scenario considers people living in vulnerable zones, as mentioned earlier. Given that the outsides of Mexico City are still in development, many houses and habitational buildings are not built with the appropriate materials or methods, resulting in physical vulnerability and, and conducting to a disaster when an earthquake hits the zone. Having mentioned earlier that the zone is limited by mountains, a notorious example of human-made risk happens when communities established in the lower parts of the ladder are often affected by landslides. Also, as seen in most subduction zones, volcanoes are present in the Mexican territory. One particular example is the Popocatépetl, located 20, 22 kilometers to the southeast of the city. Popocatépetl activity rarely stops and represents a constant hazard in the nearby communities. This means that earthquakes are not the only hazard that potentially could cause a major disaster in the city. A complex situation unravels in the capital city of Mexico. Therefore, efforts by NGOs and the academia have been made in order to raise awareness in the population. In the following slides, I will present an initiative organized by the Geophysic Museums of the National Univers Autonomous University of Mexico to disseminate scientific knowledge within communities living in high-risk zones. Understanding the dynamics of a developed country, it results disastrously obvious that the physical countermeasures, such as earthquake-resistant buildings, are neither feasible nor practical. Also, decentralization has been proposed, and it could function as a long-term strategy to reduce exposition to hazards, and therefore the risks associated. Nevertheless, planning the reestablishment of more than 9 million habitants to a non-vulnerable zone without creating any unexpected risk or tremendously endangering the environment is a near impossible task. Following this logic, non-physical countermeasures represent an excellent tool to communicate the different stages of risk and creation the much, the much needed prevention and mitigation culture within the communities. Since 2015, the Geophysics Museum of the National Autonomous University of Mexico started a series of campaigns based on the historical pro progress of seismology in Mexico and introduced activities to collectively understand concepts such as prevention, mitigation, response, and resilience. This series of campaigns wouldn't have a feedback process as the aim of the project was to merely inform population as a social service. It wasn't until September of 2017 when the Puebla earthquake hit Mexico City that the museum began campaigns in strategic and vulnerable regions of the city. Knowing that marginalized zones are usually accompanied by physical vulnerability, economical vulnerability, and institutional vulnerability, certain areas were chosen to be part of these dissemination campaigns. Through a strategic planning, the best option in terms of location and potential were elementary schools. The goal was to provide an entire new perspective within the students and their families through a direct and indirect approach. Instead of teaching them how to wait for a disaster and recover using their very limited resources, risk management concentrated in, re in working with already known risk, appropriate responses that wouldn't cause any other risks and the existence of potential risks appearing due to several and uncontrollable factors. In this sense, children and their families felt in control of otherwise unknown phenomena and were able to take decisions based in the acquired knowledge. 
Safe campaigns relied on several steps to create collective awareness. First of all, risk as an integral subject with mitigation and prevention strategies was explained in elementary schools that were located in high vulnerability zones. Two, as the creation of safeguarding groups was strongly encouraged, workshops were specifically designed to teach children how to take responsibilities within their own physical limits during a disaster. Three, indirect dissemination within their social circles, family, friends, would be recommended. And fourth, a visit was planned in the following months to measure the impact of the materials. So let, let me expand a little more in these things. First of all, understanding risk. By using materials that were visually attractive and involved the participation of students, risk processes were explained in a simple yet appropriate way. Using specific activities, such as demonstration with a scale volcano that I will show later, or, lar or large pieces of plexiglass simulated the tectonic plates will draw the attention of participants. These kind of activities will defy the widespread belief that science or scientists do not care about people in condition of vulnerability and would commence a healthy relationship with, between civil defense institutions and law firms. Besides, they engage children in a safe, accurate, and healthy environment that respects their prior knowledge and guides them into scientific, scientifically proven facts. Then the second step in these campaigns was the creation of cell guarding groups as part of prevention and mitigation strategies, students were actively involved in creating groups of volunteers that would be responsible for key actions, such as guiding other students to the safe zones, especially the older students will help in this task, helping teachers keep classmates calm and attentive, re reducing the outnumbered efforts of a singular authority figure, ringing the emergency bell, during earthquake breaks and analyzing the results in terms of time of response, potential areas of improvement and communal behavior. This engagement of students will lead them to take these roles at their own homes as they will acquire the ability of making correct and efficient decisions, keeping a calm stance during emergencies and taking responsibility within their closest circles. This eventually would lead to indirect dissemination Expecting students to share their newly acquired knowledge, the campaign intended to expand indirectly within the communities. Assuming each student had at least one parental figure, that would mean that the dissemination works would double per person. This step was crucial in the progress of campaigns as indirect dissemination has been proven to work in skeptical societies where science and technology are often seen as unfamiliar topics. By comprehensively acknowledging doubts, myths, and common belief, scient um, sorry, scientifically proven and appropriate information was delivered by children towards their parents, creating a chain of indirect dissemination. If this process was to be continued by adults within their own circles at job or in the neighborhood, the campaigns will be extremely beneficial to society as a whole, starting with raising awareness in the youngest members of communities. These are some examples of the campaigns. And as you can see, the, the hairstyle hasn't really changed <laughs> over the years. But here you can see the different generations that we were targeting. All of these are uh, public and elementary schools. Here is the little volcano. And you can see here that we will target literally everyone. So um, to assess the impact, uh, we would um, return to these schools and also we registered different uh, parameters. So the schools that we visited were 13 in total uh, before the COVID pandemic. And the actions taken were 170 self-guarding groups, 35 formal petitions to restore the local seismic alert uh, that is uh, managed by the government. 1,310 students visited the museum in the following 12 months, 26 earthquake drills, two science fairs dedicated to DRR, 24 petitions to repeat the campaigns in the same schools and positive parental feedback via email. 
Impacts in the community were satisfactory as the engagement of several generations of families began to approach the museum in order to further understand the phenomena experienced by the students. This response leads to the following proposal steps. Bringing up more advanced terms and concepts that require certain knowledge of disaster risk management. This includes the participation of the private sector as a new target of dissemination. Actively understanding and protecting business that create jobs would mean a broader approach that requires the participation of other experts in the matter of and campaigns that focus on different stages, scenarios, and elements that surround an enterprise as an entity that is related to, to its environment. The benefits of this approach will be represented by the mitigation of damages exclusively under the an economical point of view. Damage transfer and insurance policies will be introduced in small and medium enterprises, and financial education will be generally enhanced. Another route for the campaigns would include different hazards into and the uh, extensive expression of risk, taking differently organized disasters into account. Floods, abnormal weather conditions such as initial high or low temperatures, hurricanes, and forest fires could be addressed in the same methodical way. Working with the already existing risk, planning strategies for effective response without creating new risk and preventing newly formed risks by uncontrollable factors. That is using integrated disaster risk management. The situation in terms of disaster incidents in Mexico has its own very story and it won't have a conclusion in the near future. The work that needs to be done in Mexico City belongs to the areas of study of different disciplines and may look as a marathonic task. Even if that's the case, Mexicans are known for their resilience and will, and will to overcome disastrous events. We can be sure that resilience will be systematically achieved. As an advocate for disaster risk reduction, I can say that changes will come if we act together, starting with children and youth engagement and actions. Thank you. And just uh, to mention the activities, this is the scale volcano that we will use in these campaigns. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alina. That was great. And, and thanks for giving us the context uh, of, of various different hazards coming together when you're mentioning integrated disaster risk management. And also it was great to see that you had a feedback mechanism and you were able to receive positive feedback from parents and, and the community on, on the interventions. And that's that's really important for, for all of us to work on to make sure that we're always improving and having something that's sustainable. Um, so thank you for that. And thank you also to the previous speakers for, for presenting on case studies and the guidelines that exist and the, the experiences at local and national levels. We will now open up to an interactive panel discussion We've had an active Q&A in, in the chat already, but we, we also would open the floor if, if anyone would like to raise their hand and intervene and ask a specific question um, or to make a comment or, or to share. Um, I'll ask uh, the panel members if, if they can to turn on their cameras so that we know who you are and we can see you. Um, and we will get going. So if anyone wants to raise their hand, uh, please go ahead. Otherwise, I'll, I'll start uh, raising some of the questions that we had from the chat. OK, so there were some common themes in, in some of the questions and comments that came in. Um, one theme was around really sustainability and, and making sure that actions have an impact and not only to get to the impact stage, but to even get to the action stage. So as, as we mentioned before, a lot of concerns and hesitation to work on this uh, from youth themselves and, and you know, having this fear that aspirations will not turn into something that has meaning or impact on the ground. Um, so there's a, a question, you know, what, how, how can you facilitate uh, children and youth towards identifying the challenges? without being too much of a, you know, directing, you know, the way that they should go? Is it how, do you have any good uh, lessons on that? Um, and then additionally, um, how can you make sure that the impact would be sustainable? So for example, Fabrianti, this, this one is directed a bit towards your presentation and, and the kit that you presented. So uh, what is the sustainable impact after implementation of the kit? And what is your experience in uh, making sure that children and youth are identifying the challenges and, and solutions themselves without being too much directed? 
Sure, so I can probably take those two questions. Um, thank you so much, Jen. And thank you so much for the very brilliant questions. I think I would like to address the first questions on, uh, you know, how the children and youth can basically identify key challenges without, you know, direct direction by adult facilitators. So one of the uh, very uh, core components and values when we're working with adolescents, especially, you know, utilizing the methodologies, is basically to focus on to have youth and adult facilitators as the facilitators to guide the adolescents and not being, you know, being dictated uh, by these facilitators. So in the beginning, um, it is our challenges as well, um, but usually we will allow them more time to understand um, what is expected uh, from them as a facilitators. So one of the key um, lessons learned as well that we can see basically engaging youth facilitators or peer facilitators with close age gap with adolescents uh, will be great alternatives as well because they can basically have a better communications with adolescents usually with them um, less expectations um, about their role um, but to, to basically address and facilitate the communications um, and utilizing the kit. Um, the key is the methodology is not for the, uh, the facilitators to teach something or teach the content for adolescents because the content is not to be thought, but we focus on how this approach can, you know, facilitate the learning, facilitate the uh, problem solving, uh, facilitate this um, creation of solution from the adolescent. And during the, in the methodology itself in the adolescent kit, um, it also provides a guidelines for facilitators, which help us to clarify the expectations uh, that facilitators may have, and also less burden for the facilitators as well, since they're not teaching adolescents something, but just to facilitate the entire um, activities uh, with adolescents. So that's, I think, the key component where we work with adult or even youth facilitators with adolescents. Um, the second question is basically, on sustainability, how we ensure um, to see how this part participatory approach affect them after the implementation of the program. Um, so we usually have this uh, monitoring and evaluation tools, which also inspired from uh, relevant guidelines that previously mentioned with the assessment of the result. Uh, the adolescent kit itself provided the tools to measure adolescents' experiences during the activities to inform us how we can better support them. Um, in terms of programmatic senses, when we talk about sustainability, how this methodology then can be carried out, right, beyond emergency. I think this is something the good lessons learned from Indonesia as well. So for example, in our emergency intervention in one of the um, areas in Indonesia, in Sulawesi, we used the methodology initially to support the intervention in emergency. Uh, but after that, um, you know, as an aftermath of the emergency, there's also another um, issues arising, right? So for example, like child marriage, um, there's an issues also about drop out, adolescents drop out of schools, uh, which also lasts beyond the emergency period. So basically, we work with the cross sectoral organizations, local organizations. Uh, we support from child protections team, education unit. Um, we utilize this existing methodology, so adolescent kids and adolescent circles, um, to strengthen and adjust the support uh, for, uh, for the adolescent and community regarding these issues that lies beyond the emergency situation. So we then support and strengthen the advocacy of the issues with the relevant local government um, and the adolescent circles methodology, which once formed during the emergency is then transformed into kind of adolescence and child forum, which potentially embedded into a decision-making process in local um, settings. So they through the process of like um, decision-making with also local government. So then we see the transitions from one-time um, activity into the embedded system where they also have an impact in uh, local decision making. Um, and lastly, I think um, in terms of sustainability, uh, we did an upstream work where we embed this methodology into the relevant curriculums and the relevant ministries to ensure that this methodology also available um, to be distributed um, in this in, in, in basically school context or co-curricular context with a relevant ministry 
which um, can support the emergency situation or beyond uh, or in the new normal situation because the, this methodology can be tailored into that different perspective. So I think that's basically the response from my side, Jane, for the question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we do have several additional questions. Um, over to Mark and Maria. Um, what would you say are the specific role roles that teachers should should play in terms of functioning in these children's groups or youth youth groups and what advice would you have for adults and organizations that are in you know to involve all youth and community what what doesn't work and what does work in the philippines there is we are our framework that we all we also follow but Teachers have vital roles in helping our environmental advocacy in and DRRM campaigns. First, they are the one who help in identifying the target participants for in-school activities. They are uh, also support, but uh, they also support participants to understand better during uh, and after DRRM orientation um, through their follow-ups and the enrichment process. Teachers are also school coordinators, bridging our association to Ahadim, help us in conducting DRRM in school activities. They also help us mobilize, conduct DRRM school activities. Mark, do you want to add any anything to that, or any other panelists do you want to add, or? No, I think that's enough. Okay, great. So uh, we do have several questions related to COVID. And of course, that is a topic of the last two years, and it will continue for quite some time and how we have to adapt existing guidelines and the way we work in terms of access and using virtual platforms and, and how can we reach those who cannot use virtual platforms. Um, so I'll just ask, maybe I'll, I'll throw this over to Audrey, but also to others, if you have something that you would like to add on this, um, what are the newly updated guidelines in terms of disaster risk reduction in times in these times of pandemic, which is continuing for the foreseeable future? And uh, do we have guidelines when it comes to response and rescue, um, especially when physical or body contact is involved? Thank you. I think I think the guidelines we mentioned at the beginning were developed uh, just before COVID and that more and more tools are being adapted. Uh, and just shared, for instance, in the chat, something about youth participation that was mainly conceived uh, during the pandemic to uh, continue having those crucial interaction with the children, especially in times of lockdown, because we know that this is increasing even further the risk of violence and abuse in, inside the homes. So I think those new resources are slowly being compiled and, and will be uh, made available also on the websites. I'm not aware, uh, I'm not sure how to address your second question and I'll leave it open to other colleagues if you're aware of uh, new guidelines being developed specifically on this to, to please share more, thanks. Okay, yeah, I think it's a tough question. It, it might be context specific, depending on the country or the location. A lot of really effective local, you know, risk management happens quite often at the local level. So hopefully a lot of the local level front lines have been the ones really adapting in the times of the, of the pandemic and a lot of lessons learned in, in how we do DRR to incorporate the wider risk spectrum, including for biological hazards um, and you know everything multi-hazard approach that's really more effective and adaptable. Um, I want to turn a, a question over to Alina um, and just to share a little bit about the perspective of how uh, COVID impacted the work on DRR in Mexico. If, if you could share a little bit about that and how, how did priorities change? Were there opportunities that were also opening as, as part of COVID? Yeah, sure. A uh, uh, very big opportunity opened to address multi hazards. And it, it was extremely important in this context because we, we were facing uh, normal uh, disasters happening, such as earthquakes, hurricanes, and everything uh, during COVID times. So, how do we adapt it? Well, first of all, um, 
usually people have to, to go th through this training to rescue people, to manage risk, to, to, do, uh, to have anything to do with disaster management. So they are now using uh, some kind of um, protection from the, for themselves. And also um, safe spaces have been entirely re uh, rethought. For example, uh, we, are not no, we are not longer expecting people to be in a closed space during a hurricane, for example. We are trying to, to take them into broader areas where they will always be safe, but also with this uh, safe distance. Uh, during an earthquake, it, it happens the same. Um, we, we are trying to, to get less people in buildings in order to minimize the risk of, of any kind of cross-contamination or anything that happens through the biological hazard. We are slowly adapting, but these adaptations are in a long term. We are no longer um, getting back into the offices to overcrowd the job corridors. We are using more and more home office uh, modes of working and this is slowly changing the, the approach to disaster risk management in terms of um, how, how the response needs to be approaching. I hope that clarifies. Thank you so much. Uh, we do have one participant raising their hand, Shashanka, do you want to take the floor? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you fine. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, a lot of thanks to the presenter for some fantastic uh, stories and success, uh, successful kind of uh, things. Uh, it's, it's more like a comment, uh, it's no uh, question. Uh, I'd, uh, three points I would like to share. One is, uh, and, and uh, it may reiterate what they have shared as well. Number one is, uh, especially in terms of uh, continuation of the whole uh, disaster risk reduction initiatives through youth and adolescent. Uh, one uh, critical point is that the present adolescent and youths will be becoming full adults soon. So how their engagement with the whole process can be uh, planned or designed is uh, one critical area. Secondly, uh, from uh, my experience, uh, I have seen that uh, resource, especially uh, uh, financial resource is one of the key challenges that uh, make uh, the program, uh, that uh, create a challenge to make the program sustainable. So when we have uh, integrated uh, the whole idea in the curriculum, it's a fantastic state, but at the same time, if possible, we need to also tag the local level planning process and uh, uh, ensure some uh, resource mobilization uh, I, uh, kind of mechanism so that it can continue. And lastly, uh, at the same time, to identify uh, how the adolescents and youths can also uh, think about uh, much more uh, in a broader sense, the risk and vulnerabilities dimensions uh, linked to the disasters and uh, its impact. It, it, gives a, it gives a kind of a uh, wider horizon, which also gives a, create an opportunity to tap with the policymakers, resource, and also a scale up process. Uh, over to you, Jay. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Thanks to all. Thank you so much, Shashanka. That's those are really excellent points, and and absolutely, uh, you know, we're always looking for ways to improve and and to build on this work. And I, I think Mark and Maria and and Audrey and Alina and and Fabrianti have all mentioned also, you know, the need to to carry forward and the and the momentum that's needed and resources are are really gravely needed and and to be effectively used and efficiently used to to make sure that we're engaging children and youth the right ways. Um, so I know that we are actually over time and I really want to thank all of the, the presenters. Thank you so much for your excellent presentations. Thank you to the participants for joining and, and giving us your, your very valuable time at this busy time of year. And I want to thank Lucille and Tamara and Nevin in the, in the background who, and all of the GADRES partners who gave so much of their time to prepare 
for this and, and for the partnership. There is, um, you know, an email address here. If you have a follow-up question or comments, or if you want to get engaged, please do reach out. And we will follow up if there's anything pending. And we do have um, a, a discussion in the Safe Children, Safe Schools Community of Practice. And this will be an ongoing uh, continuous process. Thank you so much. Uh, we do have an additional survey if, if you have time to take it before you hop off. Um, so thanks very much, everyone. And we look forward to seeing you next time. <laughs>